We're up to chapter six, mission number six. This is the 48 ways to wisdom, and we're up to way number 11. And this is diktuk chaverim with the critique of friends. One of the ways to acquire wisdom, there are 48 ways we are told. One of the ways to acquire wisdom is with the critique of friends. If you want to study Torah, you're really pursuing truth. You know, God sees but is unseen. God is beyond the human purview. But we are still required to pursue our understanding of God as best as we can. And the way I designed it, that even though we cannot understand God himself, he's beyond us, the infinite's beyond us, but we can have some understanding of God and what he wants of us via his Torah. The Torah can serve as a proxy for us to understand God. And one of the ways to do that, one of the critical necessary components of that, is that we need some friends to help us get to truth. Only God can really act alone. Only God is truly mistake-free. Only God is perfect. Only God is an absolute. For us, we are fallible and we're prone to make mistakes. And that's why we need way number 11. We need the critique of friends in order to arrive at wisdom. When it comes to studying, good friends are indispensable. A good friend, they will provide constructive criticism. A good friend can serve as a sounding board to your ideas. You have an idea, you have a vantage point, you have a perspective. A good friend will provide another perspective, maybe a different perspective. Everyone's different. We all see the world differently. We all have different ideas. And we're all biased. A good friend especially someone that has your best interests at heart, a good friend will help you see through your own biases, will help identify your own, your own blind spots. All of us have blind spots. Even if you have peripheral vision, you can see in all directions. You can't see what's behind you. You can't see what's all the way to your right or left. No individual has the whole picture. No individual can do it alone. You cannot do transformative things alone. You need collaborators. You need partners. You need colleagues. You need peers and associates and helpers. And that's why it's so important to have a good friend who can provide critique. We don't see it all, and we need help. Moshe had help. Moshe had Aaron. Even Messiah. Messiah's going to come with the other Messiah, with Elijah. Perhaps the only exception was Abraham. The Midrash tells us that Abraham was a yachid, was alone. All he had was God. For us, if we're going to achieve anything special in our studies, in our pursuits, we're going to need helpers. We're going to need others. And when it comes to seeking wisdom, it must be done with a good friend who can provide some critique. All the sages of the Talmud, they all studied together. There was an academy. And each giant sage of their era had a Torah sparring mate that they would debate with, and they would argue with, and they would challenge, and it would be challenged. And that continued throughout the generations. The Talmud tells us that it's so imperative to have a chavrusa, to have a study partner, so much so that the sages said, O chavrusa, O misusa. Either I have a chavrusa, either I have a study partner, or give me death. Give me a study partner, or give me death. You must find someone to challenge you. Without friends, without a chavrusa, 
you lose a degree of objectivity. You see only one side of the coin. You see only your perspective. And if you go on in your studies just alone, that can amount to spiritual death. O Chavrusa, O Misusa. Similarly, the Talmud tells us the book of Brachos, page 63b. Ein ha Torah nitnes, ela bechabura. Torah is only acquired with a group of people. And the Talmud quotes the verse. The verse says, Cherev al habadim. There should be a sword on those who study alone. Just like O Chavrusa, O Misusa, either give me a study partner or give me death. A great sage who studies exclusively alone is really warranting death, deserving of death. Not only that, continues the Talmud, they will become foolish. Someone who studies alone can make terrible mistakes, can go awry, can be totally off the reservation and not even know it. If you go alone, you don't share ideas, and you don't solicit feedback, and you don't make adjustments, and you don't refine or fine-tune your thoughts, your arguments, your perspective, that's a recipe for making terrible mistakes and becoming foolish. The Talmud tells us that no one can rule accurately until they have ruled inaccurately. The only way to become proficient in ruling matters of Torah and Halacha, it's only if you make some mistakes, and then you adjust, and then you fine-tune, and you upgrade. You need feedback for that. Only then can you arrive at the truth. The Talmud gives a story of a great sage who made a horrific halachic blunder. And it was a rudimentary oversight. It wasn't an advanced question. And the Talmud says because he studied alone. When you study by yourself exclusively, you can make gross mistakes without even realizing how far off you are. But when you study with a friend, not only will you avoid those gross mistakes and those bad ideas, but even your good ideas will be further developed, will be further illuminated. You have an idea, but it could be tweaked. It could be honed. It could be sharpened. It could be expanded when you share that idea. You, you can add more insight, more perspective, refine the idea, hone the idea. The Talmud likens two study partners who are studying together to two swords that are grading against each other, each one becoming sharper from this experience, each one benefiting and being upgraded from this experience. The Talmud talks about the great Rabbi Yochanan. He's one of the first authors of the Talmud. And he had a study mate, a study partner, who also was his brother-in-law, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, known, of course, as Reish Lakish. And after Reish Lakish passed, Rabbi Yochanan was distraught. He had no one to argue with. He had no one to debate with. So all the sages were trying to come up with a solution. And they told one of their colleagues, Rabbi Elazar, why don't you go and go discuss your ideas with Rabbi Yochanan? Go try to replace Rish Lakish. After all, Rabbi Yochanan, he's the greatest sage. He needs someone really, really sharp. 
you're a candidate. So Rabbi Elazar goes and he studies with Rabbi Yochanan. And Rabbi Yochanan presents an argument. And Rabbi Elazar is very sharp. He says, wow, that's a good argument. And I even have lots of proofs to your argument. Look, I have this proof, I have that proof. Because so Rabbi Yochanan says, I don't need your proofs. I don't want a proof. I want a challenge. When Rish Lakish was here, I would say something. He wouldn't bring me proofs. He would raise 24 challenges, 24 questions to try to disprove me. And then I would have to come up with 24 different answers. And the result of that was an expansion of Torah. I don't need someone to prove what I'm saying. I need someone to challenge it. You're proving it. I know it's true because I'm saying it. I need someone to act as a foil to disagree with me. And Rabbi Yochanan lapsed into depression and he ripped his clothing and he was crying and he was wailing and he was saying, Reish Lakesh, where are you? I need you. Until he went insane. And the rest of the rabbis got together and they did something very unusual and unexpected. They prayed that he would die. And in fact, Rabbi Yochanan died. O Chavrusa, O Misusa. Give me a Chavrusa or give me death. If you're really committed to finding the truth, to trying to understand God as best as you can, you're not going to arrive there without some help. And of course, this demands of us to be receptive to other people. By, the, by, by default, we start off as being very biased and seeing things from our perspective. It's very hard for us to admit when we are wrong. We all have a different mind and a different way of seeing things. And it's specifically through the clash of different minds, each one independently seeking truth, only through that process does the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, come to light. Even today, thousands of years after Rabbi Yochanan, well, almost 2,000 years after Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakash had their debates, Today, yeshiva system is designed the same way. Everyone has a study partner. And the right kind of study partner is someone who is basically on the same level, but is a little bit different. And you know the same ability, but a different perspective. And each pursuing truth, that's a magical formula for each one of them to be sharpened from that experience. Now, this idea can extend to even, to even teaching or having a weaker study partner. In some instances, when you have a weaker study partner, it actually might be ideal. Because if you're studying with someone who is on your level or even higher, you could rely on a lot of jargon, you could take things for granted. You could skip over steps. And you could have gaps in your knowledge. If you have to explain something to a child or to a novice, you really have to explain every, every part of the idea. You've got to break it down to the smallest components. What are the assumptions? What are the things that we are accepting axiomatically? And let's critically evaluate and judge them and explain them independently and through that build the edifice of the idea. That is a really rigorous exercise that really ensures that you know what you're talking about. And you'll be able to see where are the mistakes perhaps in your thinking. And thus it's imperative to find a friend or better yet, find an audience. You have ideas. You want to bounce them off your colleagues. If you don't have colleagues, create colleagues. 
find an audience for your ideas, publish them. Maybe, dare I say, make a podcast and you have your email address. Share your ideas, bounce them off people, give a class, give a lecture and present your ideas. Don't keep them bottled up within you. Find someone that you can pass your ideas by. Make sure you're not living on an intellectual island. This is the benefits of peer review. Of course, peer review has many shortcomings, as is well-documented, but the benefit cannot be discounted. Individuals, no matter how clever or brilliant or genius they are, if they're on their own, if they don't showcase their ideas, if they don't get crucial feedback, they can make mistakes. They can develop crooked thoughts and a crooked way of thinking. And even their good ideas cannot be fully actualized because they cannot be uh, developed and burnished further with the input of other people. As you know, I appreciate all feedback. Rabbi Walby at gmail.com. I especially value negative feedback. If I made a mistake, I want to know about it. I can fix it. I could amend my notes. I can upgrade my thinking. It's not offensive. We're all trying to get at the truth. I spent, I had the great fortune of spending years in yeshiva. And there, there's no idea or individual that is untouchable. Nothing is sacrosanct. Even the greatest rabbi with the most prestige, with the most prestige and the most renown and repute, if they get up and they present their ideas, they are fair game. That's the system. Everyone benefits from having other eyes and other ears and other people look over their work. It was common for all the great sages, even the ones who lived by themselves, to write to each other, to talk with each other. Even the great Mashim Bar Yochai in his cave for 13 years, he had his son. They all had study partners. The great Rabbi El Yashiv, who always studied by himself, every single day, gave a daily public lecture open to the public. And it was encouraged for people to comment and to challenge him. This is a necessary part of the pursuit of wisdom. Good friends who can give you critique. Now, as is true with many of these 48 ways to wisdom, it's not just matters of study that this is imperative. In all manners of our life, all aspects of our life, all aspects of our personal development, having a good friend is a real boon. A good friend, someone could sit you down, tell you what you need to hear, run an intervention. Someone who could be there for you when you need their love, when you need their support, or when you need their critique. Someone who can hold you accountable. This is all necessary. The Mishnah earlier in Pirkei Avos says, Kenei lecha chaver. Acquire for yourself, pay for yourself to get a friend. There is a price that you need to pay for this sort of friendship. You have to invest in someone who cares enough about you to tell you the truth and to tell you when you're wrong and to tell you when maybe there are tweaks that can improve what you're doing or what you're thinking. And part of the price you need to pay is you have to be willing to accept their in input and to take it seriously. And no one likes to be told that they're wrong or that they are off course. It demands that you make yourself very vulnerable. But opening up yourself to be 
receptive, to be willing to accept criticism and to consider just maybe, maybe, maybe that you're wrong and other people are right. Being willing to reconsider what you hold and believe perhaps strongly, being willing to admit when you're wrong, this is absolutely critical to life. And of course, it is critical to our pursuit of wisdom, our pursuit of Torah, our pursuit of study of any kind. And this is way number 11, to have a good, a good friend, to have a good friend who can provide you with valuable feedback. I consider all of y'all to be my good friends. If there's ever something that I say that you find is either wrong or can be improved or can be expanded, please, please, please send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com.